Hello, welcome to With Winnie in Mind. I'm your host, Troy Basham, along with Lanny. And today we're going to be talking about that old phrase, it's not what happens to your life, it's what you do about what happens to your life, or something like that. So, Lanny, we were talking about this morning on the way over here as far as, you know, you hear this phrase all the time, but what does it really mean? Because I think when I first heard it, what it really means isn't what people really were talking about. Like, I thought it was like, oh, we lost the game, everyone's upset, and the coach is like, look, it's it doesn't matter that we lost. What matters is we got to prepare for the next game. And so for years in team sports, I always thought, wow, I, I guess we just forget about it, move on to the next one. But you were, you were talking about saying, no, no, because that doesn't handle – the situation that happened that only moved you to the next anticipation phase of the next uh, task that you have. So, kind of dive a little bit deeper on how you think that phrase should be handled and how we should live by it. Well, it fits into a really important principle uh, that we teach here: that uh, everything you do in your life has three phases to it anticipation phase and action what you think about before the action the action phase what you think about during the action and the reinforcement phase what you think about after the action well we're in the reinforcement phase after the action and i think one of the critical things that uh, this little phrase that we hear is really talking about is that you do something appropriate after the action. If the action is a game or the action is a shot, like if you're in golf and, and you hit a shot, uh, do you respond or do you react to uh, what just happened? You know, what, what you do after the action makes a, a huge difference, determines essentially whether or not you're going to move forward or possibly if it's going to be hurt you. And so there's a difference between something that you're reacting to it and responding to it. You know, reacting takes no mental maturity at all to do. We knew how to react when we were born, you know, when things are good, uh, you know, like a baby uh, they, 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 they are happy when everything is going well, but when that, uh, you know, things are not they're going their way, uh, they let you know it. And so it's, it's, we always knew how to react, but responding takes some mental maturity. Responding is where you analyze what just happened and you say, okay, uh, if it's something that was good, certainly you can reinforce a good, uh, a good uh, action or a good, good shot. Uh, it's certainly appropriate for you to reinforce that. But uh, if it's a bad shot, uh, responding is learning from, from that, that mistake. You know, that, that's why that phrase, uh, it's... it's uh, it's not important what happens to you in life. It's important what you do next. I mean, what? how do you respond to what happens to your life? I think so, so many times we see people, uh, well, I, here's how I'm going to respond to it. I'm going to be mad or I'm going to uh, talk about it to people. I'm going to tell everybody how bad a day I had or a bad shot was. And you see this all the time in, in sport. When you go to uh, competitions or and, and players are coming off the off the field, or, or even uh, students that are involved, uh, those of you that are have parents that are uh, in uh, competitions, when you pick them up from the, after the game, uh, what do they talk about? Do they talk about what went right or what went wrong if they lost the game or if they didn't play well? Uh, they t they talk about their mistakes first. And uh, so it's, it's rare that they really talk about what they needed to do next. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I think a lot of people fall in. They don't look at that mental maturity thing. They just fall in the trap of, I don't like what happened, so I'm just going to share 
my reaction to it. And you're right, it doesn't take any mental maturity, but we're all good at it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> everyone's good at it. So it reminds me of, I'll set, I'll set up with this. So I work with a lot of, well, I work with a variety of athletes from young all the way, you know, as early as, you know, middle school up to, you know, 50 people in their 50s or 60s competing in a variety of sports. But the predominant group that I work with are the, the high school to collegiate level athletes in that age demographic, which I think is the most impressionable age. From that 14 to 22 years of age, there's a lot of development, obviously, in the body, but also in the mind where they're starting to learn how to handle certain things. But the one thing that they don't really do in general is learn how to respond to certain things. But I, I remember watching a video on Tom Brady and where they picked up conversations he had during that comeback Super Bowl win against Atlanta. Do you remember that? And there was there was two scenes that was just to me a perfect example of what we're about to to go into discussion about is he had a wide receiver open and he missed him in the corner of the end zone. Now it was a a pretty deep ball. It wasn't like a, a short 15 yard pass. But he goes over of course the, the guy's upset because it would have been an easy touchdown. He's, he was open, but Brady missed him, which doesn't happen. If you know Tom Brady, he doesn't miss very many wide open receivers. He goes over to the sideline, finds the guy, he goes, Hey, next he goes, You run that route, next time it will be there. He took ownership, but he he said it in a way that made me pick this. So if I'm picturing this, I'm sure the receiver's picturing it. That oh, next time that that ball's going to be right in my hands. Okay, I got it. I got it. You know, he didn't blame me for running the wrong route. He didn't um, you know come up with an excuse. He just said next time it'll be there. And then the other clip that he had is the offensive line was struggling. And so they were kind of upset. He goes up to him. He goes, hey, heads up, heads up. Stick with the game plan. Stick with the process. You know, game's not over. Just don't don't worry about that. He pointed to this, the scoreboard. He goes, don't worry about that. Just just worry about the game plan. One one play at a time. And so these guys were reacting to the fact that, it, we're three and out. This is a pattern. We're down by, you know, 20 points. What are we going to do? And he's over like, hey, just focus on the process. One you know, one play at a time kind of thing. So why is it someone, they're on the same team, why is someone upset and the other one is not, even though they they experience the same situation? I don't think that most people are aware that they are doing something wrong when they uh, do something different from what we're talking about. If you make a mistake, I think a lot of people think that if I make a mistake, then, then the appropriate thing to do is to, is to be sad about it and be angry about it and beat myself up. And, uh, well, if you're beating yourself up, I, my, I have one question for you. How's that working out for you? <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. And I think what is, is so important about the example that you made is that uh, he was talking about the solution to the problem. He wasn't talking about the problem. He didn't go over there and say, say well, I, you know, I screwed up and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, and talking about the problem, he'd already corrected the problem in his mind uh, when he when he was thinking. Brady uh, had already decided that well, I've got to I've got to do something a little bit better or different to be able to solve the problem. I think the key to responding, and this is just not taught enough, is that the key to responding is to seek. If there's something wrong with what we did, if we made a mistake, what's the solution? What is the the solution to the problem? How do I fix this problem? If it didn't work, what would make it work? And uh, so I think that in, in our training, we call that a reinforcement phase uh, – the uh, what you think about immediately after the action, if it's a good uh, response that you reinforce that, you think about it. You know, it's I, I like the when the guys go like this and when you know they 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 reinforce it. I think that's good for the self image. 
But when it doesn't go good, instead of beating yourself up or talking negatively about it, you should say, well, okay, what's the solution to that? How do, how do I fix that? What work does it need? If, it's, if it needs work, what work does it need? And that's what is the difference between the way Brady was operating and the way that I think a lot of people operate. And that is one of the reasons why he was so good, is so that he's talking about the solution to the problem and not the problem itself. Yeah, it's interesting when you look at the reinforcing part of that before we get into the, you know, rehearsing the correction. So it wasn't that long ago that the NFL – you know, American football here is probably the biggest – well, I don't think there's a sport even close to it. You know, more people watch that on Sunday than probably any other sport. And when they when they allow the players to celebrate, you know, after a touchdown and so forth, and it's kind of carried down to where you'll see a receiver get a first down and they do a little hand gesture or something like that. And, you know, some people might think that's overkill. It's like, well, wait a minute. you got Your job is to catch the ball and get a first down, you know. But I look at it as in like, okay, when they do that over and over, what are they convincing themselves to do? It's like me to get first downs. It's like me to make the catch. It's like me to get that. And so you have those those different hands, you know, the one where the guy goes like this, you know, mimicking um, the uh, old uh, Hulk Hogan move in wrestling way back when I was a a kid. And then you look at another one like uh, Zeke Elliott, you know, we played for Dallas. I'm sure yeah. he still does the same thing. Where he he does the feed yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. You know, he gets on the roll. He's like, "No, nah, just feed me. I'll get the first down. I'll get the first down." And so these players really start believing that, "Hey, this is who I am—a guy who gets the job done." And it's a way they can just physically express it out. So, if it works in the reinforcement phase to our benefit, I'd imagine if we react in a way that is negative, you know, there's definitely something positive about, you know, yeah, I got the first down to celebrating after touchdown and, and having that excitement, that fist pump. But if I react that way, when it's negative, it would still have the same impact on the self image. And, and I don't think people really make that, that connection. And that's one of the things that you made the connection to is that self image is really being affected most after an action, not, you know, before or during it's really, after how you handle what just happened probably has more to do with building someone's confidence than any other part of their their sport. And so what is your suggestion or what do you suggest to your clients as far as, okay, when this happens and it's not what you want, this is what you should do instead of what you're doing. What do you suggest that they do? And kind of in a simplistic term, that would be helpful to people. Well, any time of any type of imprinting uh, that's closest to the action, the closer it is to the action. Imprinting meaning what you think about, what you talk about, what you write about. When it's closest to the action itself, like that first conversation you have with yourself after you drop a ball or miss a, a free throw or or miss a penalty kick, or whatever it is. That first conversation imprints stronger on your self-image, or that first conversation you have with a coach, or a parent, or somebody else, or another player, uh, has more impact on your self-image than at any other time. It's a it's a precious moment. That's where your self-image is open to imprinting, and so. If that's true, and I believe that it is, it's it's a precious time, and a person that's really aware of this is going to make sure that that imprinting is either a solution-based imprint or as as a uh, a reinforcement of something that he did right, and or every time that you think about the solution, your self-image grows. Every time you think about uh, a success, the self-image grows. But every time you beat yourself up, self-image shrinks. Or even thinking about the problem, talking about the problem. And so many people talk about their mistakes way too much uh, to other other people. Like every time that happens, their uh, self-image shrinks. They become it becomes like them to 
uh, become whatever they're reinforcing. So there's a special time when you should not do that, and that's immediately after the action. So when you're competing or you're going through different tasks in your sport, think about the times that you're actually focusing on what happened. How do you handle it? Do you react? Do you respond? If this information is helpful for you, click that uh, like button. Think about subscribing. It really helps us with providing you more content. So diving deeper into what we're talking about is, for us, we break things down to three steps. You know, we, we've got, you've got three areas of performance, conscious, subconscious, self-image, you know, how you think, your skills, and your habits and attitudes. And there's there's three phases to every task, the anticipation, action, reinforcement phase. And what we're really hitting on is you're hitting on the fact that the reinforcement phase is directly connected or, or affects the self-image more than the other two, two parts. And how we control our thoughts is not just from how we handle from people around us, you know, obviously, if I react in a negative way in a team sport, it could have an effect and a domino effect on other other people. But if I handle myself in a more productive way, it might be more productive. So we do a lot with individual sports, but we have a lot of people that compete in team sports that watch our channel. And so is it safe to say that there's a self-image for the individual, but there's also a self-image for the team and how people on the team are, are handling a situation could affect that the self-image of the team. Would you agree with that? And if, if so, how do they? How do you take a team approach? Can one individual help change that dynamic? Well, I think that uh, I think a self-image, a team has a self-image. You know, if your uh, if your if your team is uh, if 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 you played eleven games and you're you're ten and one, you have one self-image. If you're one and ten, you have another self-image. <laughs> I mean, you know, outcome does imprint on on uh, on a team's self-image. It's it, but here's the interesting thing about team sports. It's possible. What I like about in, in individual sports like archery and shooting and 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 golf and things like that is that uh, you get all the credit and you get all the blame. You know, and you don't have to. But it's possible in team sports for you to have a really good game and your team can lose. Mm. But if several guys are, you see this happen all the time in football because we, we watch football and we, you see it happen, uh, is that the camera will, will follow a player who's over there talking to his, uh, trying to motivate his teammates. Maybe it, it's not a player that's having a bad time that's doing that. A guy that's having a bad time is sitting on the bench and nobody's talking to him, and, and that's probably a good thing. But it's the guy that's, that's playing well, but his team isn't, and he's over there uh, trying to motivate the, 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 his teammates. So that's a real good example of, of how it, um, it impacts a team. If you have one guy uh, that's a leader in the team that will uh, go and, like Brady did with his offensive line, you know, going and, t and, and telling them, get it, bringing them back, don't focus on, on our record or focus on the score or anything like that. Focus on the process of executing your job well. That's yeah. the answer. Well, it was interesting because the you know talking about football. It's, I watched a podcast with um, you know McAfee has Aaron Rodgers on quite a bit, and they were talking about different cadences that quarterbacks use. And I week before watched a video on the strangest cadences of, of football players in the NFL, which the pretty some of them get pretty comical. You know what they're they're saying, and. Uh, I was watching this, and, of course, if you've watched the Dallas Cowboys, you notice that Dak Prescott has a new cadence. And it's like, here we go, here we go, and then, you know, hike the ball. <laughs> and it's like, what's going on with that? And Aaron Rodgers is like, I got to – you know, he's brilliant to come with that. He actually broke it down and, and gave – a lot of credit to Dak and saying that, you know, that's providing, and he gives these examples of what it's doing for the team, gives you a quarterback perspective of he's changed that cadence, but here's what it does to the team, and here's the success they're having with getting the defense offside, getting people on the same page, and 
kind of went into in depth and just said, man, it was it's brilliant, you know, on how things go on. And if you know, if you're a Dallas Cowboy fan, last year Dak had a lot of interceptions. This year he's not even close to the top ten. And so it's kind of like, okay, he addressed, you know, the the anticipation phase of that play to where it can better get people where they need to be and he can make the play. But what really, if you if you listen to the conversation, it's, okay, last year he didn't have a good season. Well, he came up with a way to have a better season this year. So that, with the anticipation phase being better this season in that area, really started because the reinforcement phase of the of the end of the season and looking back and saying, well, what can I do to, to be in a better situation to help my team be in a better situation? And I'm sure in the off season, he worked on that and came up with that. I, I doubt he came up with that cadence just on the fly, you know, before you know, this regular season came up, but they don't talk about that. They've talked about mainly the, you know, before the play, this is what they're doing. This is what they're doing. This is effective. This is why it's effective. But the reality is that was done way back in the reinforcement phase of a, of a season. And so the reinforcement phase can be many different things. It can't. It's not just like in our sport, we shoot a shot. You know, you shoot a 10, you're happy. You shoot an 8, you're mad. You know, that kind of thing. But even, you know, I, I shoot prone, then I go to, go, go to the next position, then go to the next position. So, and we were shooting was prone, standing, kneeling. It's kind of funny how they changed the, the format, but – after prone, if you didn't do well, you still got to go shoot standing. You don't have time to to throw a pity party. But there are many times I remember people throwing stuff around right next to the point that I'm shooting and just all upset. And I'm like, well, I don't have to worry about that guy, you know. And But you really, if you don't bring closure to that, how are you going to shoot the next position? And then after that day is over, I gotta bring, I've got to bring closure to that day because it's, it's a multiple-day event. And so I've always wondered – because you talk a lot about the reinforced phase of a task of the of the task that in shooting it's every shot, in golf it's it's every shot. It's very very simple in in those point to point sports, but there's more to it because then if you got multiple day event, you still have a, a reinforcement phase of the first day going into the second day. If you have a sport like we do where there's multiple positions within the day. You still have to bring closure to that one position, go to the next position. So do you see a do- potential domino effect if people don't handle this this reinforcement phase of a task? If they don't respond appropriately to, okay, I didn't start well. Well, I would think you have to handle that reinforcement phase correctly so then it won't spiral out of control. And then now you've got one bad you know, event turns into another bad event. Next thing you know, the whole, you know, performance is, is bad. And, uh, and I'm sure it varies from one sport to another of the different tasks that you have, but I don't think there's one that's more important than the other. I think all the reinforcement phases, you know, handling what happens to you is important no matter what it is. Well, yeah. And I think people don't realize that uh, we're not just talking about, like just take off, for example, we're not just talking about the reinforcement phase of a particular shot. We're talking about the reinforcement phase of a whole, the reinforcement phase of a tournament day, uh, or even the reinforcement phase of anything that you do. Anything that you do, if you can identify the task, what is the task? If the task is uh, hitting a golf ball or putting a ball, if the task, there's a there's always an anticipation phase, what you think about before the task. There's always an action phase, what you're thinking about during a task. And sometimes the task is so short, you don't really don't have to think about it like if it's a, if it's a shot uh, in 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 rifle shooting, or if it's a, a even even a putt, a putt is so is so quick that you're probably not thinking about it while you're putting, right? and uh, but you have plenty of time to think about after the putt, and 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 you can even think about a hole. Uh, so a hole is kind of a, a golf version of a stage. In, in rifle shooting, I and mean, they got 18 stages, and we have three stages. Well, uh, and and maybe archery, uh, they have ends where they shoot, you know, three to six arrows at, at a time, and then they go out and down and score that stage, and then you've got another stage following out, another stage following until you shoot your 64 arrows or whatever you're shooting, and so. Um, uh, 
the R seventy two or whatever they shoot. Yeah, that big is seventy two. Yeah, but but the the uh, uh, the thing that that happens is that every if you can once you identify a task, and I even talk to to students about the fact that there's a reinforcement phase to a class in school. Yeah, you know, the anticipation phase, did mm-hmm. you do your homework? Or, you know, did you bring your book to school? And, you, you know, do you pay attention in class at the action phase? And then the reinforcement phase is the it starts when the bell rings. And what most people do is they bolt for the door, <laughs> close their door, <laughs> close their books and bolt for the door, you know, <laughs> I got to get out of here. And one of the things that I, that I, I suggest to the students was uh, to, to show you the difference between what you could do in the reinforcement phase. If you sit there and let them, you know, cloud, uh, you know, crowd up to the door, and just say to yourself, what's, uh, what's one or two th- possible test questions, and what would be the answers? And you write those down uh, so, uh, right, right after the, the, the class is over. Uh, if, if, when, whatever you do at that moment relates to your self-image, very much it, the, the self-image is very much like your memory. You won't have any problem answering those questions on an exam. So you can probably cut your study time for an exam by maybe a third. And uh, I wish I'd known that when I was going to you mean, school. You mean it's not a race to see who can get out that door the fastest? And well, you if got you, four or five you, people trying to fit through that door? If you want to cut your study time down... And those of you that are uh, students that are in school that are competitors, uh, it's likely you're going to miss some school because of uh, tournaments and things like that. And uh, you need techniques to be able to uh, still keep your grades up so that you can possibly continue to to compete. And uh, So basically, everyone's going to make a mad dash to the door. It's going to take you 30 seconds to get through the door anyway, and you're going to, have to wait for people to get through. Right. Take that time and just focus on, okay, what's the one or two takeaways I need to know? They're, it's probably going to be on a test, or it's going to be important for me to know, and just reinforce that, and then get up, and then now I'm walking out the door, and I don't have to worry about bumping into people. Much better than just trying to go with the herd. Well, that kind of goes into the whole, you know, you, you can follow the herd and wind up where they're going, yeah. or you can do something different and wind up in a different place. That's uh, right. No, I, I'm, I'm guilty. I was, I was bolting for the, yeah, the door. Yeah, I probably <laughs> was too. But I wish, I, I would have, I would have had more time. I would have had, uh, I would have had an easier time if I had made it a, a practice of reinforcing what I, what's the solution to the problem. What is what's a potential um, a potential question that could be on a test, and what is the uh, what's the answer? You know, there's almost every lecture that a that a that a teacher makes in a class. There's probably one or two things that they are. Uh, going to emphasize that you're probably going to be on the test. I know when you know both of us were in the military, and the military doesn't doesn't even hide anything. They're very transparent. At every class, you always say any of the if you've ever been in a military class, they always say the same thing at the beginning of the class. Uh, you, they tell you what the test questions are, then they teach you the class, and then they tell you what the test questions are at the end. So you know you got to be really stupid not to know. <laughs> what's on the test because it just make sure that you get those three. I had a professor in college that used to stamp on the his foot on the floor and make a noise to wake wake people up <laughs> when he got to a test question and he told us at the at the beginning of the class he says if you hear me stamp the you better know that <laughs> no, I thought that was that was that was so helpful <laughs> it's, it's like when the uh the pastor raises his voice during a sermon. Yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, this this is probably important. I probably need to remember th- this part. Uh, teachers do that in class, yeah, you yeah. know, where they'll they'll be making a point, and they're like, 
either raise their voice or to repeat what they just said, and then you didn't hear it, and you're like, oh, I should probably listen to, yeah, to that. Probably. So so this whole whole phrase of, you know, it's not important what happens to us, it's important how we handle or re- respond to what happens to us that's important. It's really a life thing. It's not just a sport thing, even oh, though yeah. we deal with it in sport. You know, it's um, – I was talking to you earlier about – my youngest was a she was a, she works for a, a a parts you know place and so they often they got to go get other parts from other part places well Dallas Fort Worth's a big area you know and she works in Irving and they someone her boss said hey I need you to run an errand for me and go to Dallas so it's an area she's not familiar with it's 7:30 in the morning you know so she she gets there. She's not familiar with the area. It's it's kind of a, a strange, sketchy environment to her. And then she realizes that they don't open until 8 o'clock, and she's there 10 minutes early. And, oh, by the way, I have no gas. The, the, no one put gas in the parts truck. And she's like freaking out. And so finally when it was all, all done, she calls me telling me all about it. And I'm like, okay, so – and you know what the worst part of it, Dad, is? I'm like, what's that? He goes, they want me to go to other places. Oh, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going back to work, and I'm going to do my normal job. I'm not doing this. I'm like, well, just find a gas station, because they have to go to a certain gas station. Find a gas station. Take a couple of deep breaths. Fill it up. Then call me. So she does that. She calls me and said, okay, you just went through this. Just go back. Give them the parts and say, where do you need me to go next? You know, how do you want to handle yourself when you get there? Think about that because right now you're about to go in there and unleash, <laughs> you know, the the wrath of Sydney, and um, which she can do quite quite well. But what's funny is how, how she said, well, I know they want me to go here, and that's not a problem. That's this, this, this. And her attitude started changing as she started realizing that, okay, it wasn't that bad. You know, I got there early, which is what you want to do. You know, I was able to, to, to get what I needed in a short period of time. Uh, actually made one of the other people, you know, laugh. Because she walks in there. This is, it was pretty funny. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but it's kind of funny. She walks in and gets the parts, and the, the first person looks at her and goes, well, we don't get much white girls around this part. Mm-hmm. And so she, Cindy says, well, then I made your day. And the girl started laughing, and she goes, she's funny. And she puts her stuff on the ground and walk off. I said, so you made somebody laugh, you know? And uh, so she started thinking about that and really wasn't as bad as it as she thought it was going to be in that environment. So it really is a, is a life lesson well, thing. So anything else you'd like to add to this? No, I think that, uh, that to, to sum this up is that that – uh, old saying, and it's a great saying, is that it's said it a lot of different ways. Is that uh, what's important in life is not necessarily what happens to you, but how you handle it, and your attitude after you you the, the, whatever happens. And if it's if it's good, if you've had a good day, uh, um, count your blessings. And if you've had a bad day, still count your blessings, but but uh, try to correct your faults so that that you uh, every time that you correct a mistake, uh, make a mis- Don't be afraid to make a mistake, but when you make one, uh, make sure that you find the solution, and uh, that builds self-image too. So there's a difference between responding and reacting, and just just be somebody that responds. So with that, we'll close out, and always keep with winning in your mind.